Well, there's nothing like some bizarre historical facts to make us uh, question if we're really living in, in a real world or a cartoon or what. Yeah. Are you even watching this video? Do James and I really exist? Let's find out, maybe. Yeah. All right, if this first case doesn't make you question reality just a bit, then I'm not sure what will. Anthony Hopkins had just landed the leading role in the movie adaptation, The Girl from Petrovka by George Pfeiffer. Wanting to start research and familiarize himself with the character, he did what any good actor would do and decided to read the damn book. He went to London and sifted through a number of bookstores, but none of them had the novel he was looking for. Eventually, Hopkins decided he had to just head back home, but while waiting at a subway station, he happened to spot a book on a bench. Curious, he picked it up and was thrilled to realize that it was a copy of the girl from Pedrovka. I mean, what are the chances of that? Inside the book were a bunch of scribbled notes, but that was fine, it would have to do. Well, two years later, Hopkins was filming in Vienna, and the book's author, George Pfeiffer, visited the set one day. Hopkins struck up a conversation with Pfeiffer, who ended up telling the actor that he'd lost his own copy of his book having given it to a friend who'd lost it somewhere in London. Hopkins was stunned to realize that the book he'd found in the London subway was the author's very own copy, filled with his handwritten notes. Next up, we have the historic fact that it's not actually possible to prove that we are not, in fact, living in a simulation. While nuclear physicist Zora Dabudi claims that we must not be living in a simulation because if we were cosmic rays, highly energetic particles traveling through space at a speed approaching light speed would appear as pixels rather than unbending beams. But this theory is quickly undermined when you take the words of NYU philosopher David Chalmers into account who said that you're not going to get proof that we're not in a simulation because any evidence that we are not could be simulated. It's a paradox. But it doesn't end there. If you want to take the scientific route to disprove Davuti's definitive claim rather than the philosophical one, you can do that too. Because apparently we have already determined our universe's pixel size and it's a Planck length, spelled P-L-A-N-C-K, which is 10 to the power of negative 20 times the size of a proton. It's really small. And it's also the point at which concepts of time and gravity no longer apply, which leads us to the conclusion that if the world is in fact a simulation, it is made up of a countless number of Planck length pixels. Forget 4K, we're living in 400. Operation Paul Bunyan, another story that sounds like something out of a cartoon rather than a true event from history. Back in 1976, North Korea and the United States both had troops stationed in the Korean demilitarized zone, separating North and South Korea. On August 18th of that year, a group of American soldiers went to trim a tree in the DMZ. This tree was blocking the view from a United Nations command checkpoint, and the soldiers wanted to improve visibility. But as they started trimming, North Korean soldiers confronted them and brutally attacked, killing two American officers with axes. So the U.S. carried out a mission named after a legendary lumberjack, Paul Bunyan. On August 21st, three days after the attack, the U.S. and South Korean forces sent a convoy of military vehicles into the DMZ, packed with armed soldiers. Overhead, there were fighter jets and attack helicopters. Heavy artillery was close by as well. And what were they going to do? Well, they were there to obliterate that tree. It was an over-the-top display of military might. The U.S. troops cut down the tree, and then they calmly packed up and left. It sent a clear message that they had the power to respond with violence, but they were avoiding escalation at the same time. It sounds pretty ridiculous when you first describe it, but it actually does make a lot of sense. Next up, we have the old Russian doll simulation theory, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. A simulation inside a simulation, inside a simulation, and so on and so forth. The theory comes from Nick Bostrom's simulation hypothesis, which basically states that if humanity is around long enough to create convincing reality simulation technology, and if their simulated reality is around long enough to, to create their own convincing simulations of reality, they will. If this 
this is truly the case, there would be countless simulated realities with only one existing base reality, making the idea of us living inside of a simulation a probability equation with a solution that states that the odds of us living inside a simulation are far more likely than the odds of us being the base reality. Not only that, but it's also highly likely that the reality that created us isn't the base reality either. We might simply just be a product of a product of a product of a product. You get the point. So here's another historical fact that just doesn't sound real. The war on Neptune. And Neptune is not an allegory here. This was a literal war on the god of the sea. The Roman Emperor Caligula is often thought of as pretty mad. He was known for some very unpredictable behavior and wild antics, and this is a perfect example of that. He declared war on Neptune, the Roman god of the sea. He ordered his soldiers to go to the coast and collect seashells as spoils of war. That's how he intended to uh, show Neptune who was boss. Some say he even had the soldiers slash at waves with their swords. So why the hell did he do this? Some historians think it was just a way for him to show off his military power. He was known to make some pretty grandiose gestures and declaring war on a god fit right into his eccentric and unpredictable style. Next up, we've got some quirky code, or should I say, some computer code in our quarks. For those of you who don't know what quarks are, they're a type of elementary particle that are absolutely fundamental to the existence of matter. Matter being pretty much anything that exists in this universe other than light, sound, heat, energy, gravity, and time. So yeah quarks are pretty important, especially to theoretical physicist James Gates, who claims to have found literal computer code embedded in equations relating to string theory. String theory being an incredibly complicated scientific theory that I will now attempt to explain to you in just a few short sentences. Basically, string theory says that absolutely everything in this universe is connected, and that the universe is made up of and connected by tiny vibrating strings strings that are smaller than the smallest subatomic particles, which are really small and include quarks. Now, back to how this all proves simulation theory. While studying an equation about quarks, electrons, and supersymmetry, Gates discovered a computer code embedded in the mathematical equation, but not just any computer code. He discovered an error correcting code, the same code that is used to make web browsers work. I'll say it again, the same code used to make web browsers work was discovered in an equation pertaining to the literal building blocks of our universe. If that doesn't get you thinking, I, I throw my hands up. I really don't know what will. All right, Mark Twain, the famous author of classics like The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, he made a really eerie prediction about his very own death. It's one of those stories that makes you wonder if there's certain things about reality that science just doesn't fully understand. Twain was born in 1835, in that same year Halley's Comet, which only comes around once every 76 years, made an appearance in the sky. Twain thought that this was pretty significant. He was so struck by the timing that he made a bold prediction later in his life. He said, I came in with Halley's Comet. It is coming again next year. The Almighty has said no doubt. Now there are these two unaccountable freaks. They came in together, they must go out together. And he really did seem genuinely convinced that his life was somehow connected to the comet. You could even say the two were intertwined. Well, he ended up being right. Halley's Comet came back in 1910 and Twain died on April 21st, just one day after the comet's closest approach to Earth. April 21st, also my birthday. Next up, let's take a short break from breaking our brains with complicated theories, philosophical prompts, and math, and instead break our brains with something else. Pictures like this one of two benches, a clear example of a simulation glitch, copy and pasting code. Not convinced? How about these guys? Or these ladies? Or these two cars that clearly shouldn't both exist, why are they parked next to each other? Or this 
copy and pasted cat. Or how about this glitch? These photos were taken just moments apart, but something is very different about them. If you look closely, you will notice that in the first photograph, the little girl is missing maybe two teeth on the bottom row of her mouth. Now look at the next photo. All of a sudden, her bottom teeth have reappeared, and now her top ones are missing. It's just too weird. Honestly, it might hurt your brain less just to chalk it up to computer error. I don't know. Let's move on. James? All those images reminded me of a time I'd, I'd come out of a Jack Astor's with my cousin, and we were walking through the parking lot, and all of the cars were white. Like, literally, every single, it was like, holy crap, it was like one of those times in a video game where it seems like things just haven't rendered fully yet. It was weird. Next, I want to talk about the Dancing Plague of 1518, uh, which I know has been talked about to death, but could this unexplained event in history actually be an example of a glitch in the matrix? I mean, it's talked about a lot for a reason. It's one of the strangest and most mysterious incidents in history. For the few of you who are unfamiliar though, in July of 1518 in France, a woman stepped into the street and started dancing. And dancing and dancing, she just kept going. It went from strange but kind of endearing to a bit concerning. Hours then turned into days. And even more strangely, others started joining in. Within a week, dozens of people were dancing in the streets. They danced day and night without rest or food. Some danced until they collapsed from exhaustion. And horrifyingly, the dancers looked terrified. It was like they were being controlled like puppets by some unseen force. And the dancing spread. More and more people started joining in, seemingly unable to control their movements. Eventually, after several weeks of this, the dancing stopped as mysteriously as it began. Those who survived were left in shock and were confused. They had no clear explanation for why they'd started dancing. So. And finally, we have the fact that in 2017, a multidisciplinary group of researchers working at the University of Washington proved that computer code could literally be embedded into a person's physical strands of DNA, which obviously has led to a crap ton of people seriously questioning whether or not what we perceive as biological reality has been just computer code all along. The technology is incredibly advanced, so advanced that it is likely that in the next decade we could see coding DNA becoming a common global practice. What implications does this have in regard to simulation theory? Well, perhaps the reason that we were able to embed code into and alter the code of our DNA in the first place is because it was already code in the first place. Think about it. Do you feel like uh, Neo in the Matrix yet? Huh. Whoa. If all this didn't do it for you, have you ever seen your neighbor taking in the groceries. I see that online a lot. Oh, the people don't see it? No. Nope. That's, oh. Have you ever seen it? If you have, let us know because you'd be the first. I think I've seen it. James. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs>